You're listening to Art Heroes Podcast, the show to help you thrive as a digital artist. Tune in to learn how to transform your passion into a career. Get inspired by other kick-ass 2D and 3D artists and find out what it takes to be an art hero. Welcome to the Art Heroes Podcast, guys. This is Maria JD, and I'm really excited to introduce our today's guest. I'm going to be talking with Kristen Fernsteiner, and she's a professional 3D generalist with over seven years of experience in CG entertainment industry. She's actually been known for building and simulating digital hair and fur for Marvel and Disney movies, including Avengers Endgame, Cursed, Wonder Woman 1984, and Runs Gone Wrong. Kristen is specialized in grooming and she's developing her career in this direction now. She worked for several years as a generalist before joining Double Negative and now she joined ILM TV team in 2020 where she currently works today. Kristen is also known for leading several workshops for CGMA and for Nomen Workshop in grooming techniques. Please meet Kristen. All right, we're now live. Kristen, welcome so much to the show and super uh, glad to have you at our Heroes podcast. Hi. Thanks for having me. Hey. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, if you have not met Kristen before, you should definitely check her out. And uh, uh, we'll, well, I mean, I can talk about Kristen a lot because uh, she's one of my favorite groomers out there. I uh, literally mm -hmm. studied certain things frame by frame. Uh, to figure out but like you just can't figure it out from the outside so <laughs> we'll try to uh, ask Christine certain things today and you know just understand uh, a little bit about grooming um Kristen do you do you want to introduce yourself like what do you want people to know about you hey <laughs> thank you so much first of all uh yeah I am a digital hairdresser so I usually work in visual effects on um uh, on digital doubles uh, or like digital creatures. So for clients like Disney or Marvel or Netflix. So in, in, in case you have seen like a character with like very floaty hair, zero gravity hair or a creature with like marvelous <laughs> uh, CG hair, there's a high chance that I worked on it. So yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love that definition of a digital hairdresser because that's, that's pretty specific. Although, you know, I think it would be really interesting to mention that uh, um, it's not just a hairdresser for uh, humans and not even for creatures because you can meet hair in so many different elements, right? Like, yeah. or like fur. What are like the, some, other, some other uses of that? There's like everything, like uh, it can be like even like cloth or environments like grass so grooming can be used on almost everything um it's mostly used on digital doubles we do like a lot of replacements with humans for stunts for example or if you have like a effect shot where hair blows up or anything like that um we also do a lot of like feature replacements if you work with like a dog or something it's very difficult to to kind of maintain like the expressions you want so we replace like the face with the or, um, or fantastic creatures as well. So um, like, uh, for example, rockets or Hulk, these are all like computer generators and have digital hair as well. Wow, okay. And uh, uh, yeah, this is crazy. I like the grooming of grass, by the way, <laughs> the concept. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, kind of, uh, let's start with, uh, Actually, let's start with you because that's what, you know, my favorite question. So how did you actually get into uh, grooming and uh, how, like, how did it happen that your career took, took this direction? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's actually a long story. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we've got time. Let's go with a long story. Yeah, everyone grab their tea now. So, uh, <laughs> so basically, I uh, studied actually media design in Germany back then. It's uh, basically art school. You learn a lot about film techniques. It was a huge part about 3D as well. Um, so I came in touch with like digital sculpting and character generation and character animation as well. 
and uh, that always fascinated me. Back then, I was I was terrible <laughs> to say. So, um, so I started getting into character sculpting mainly as my main goal, and also character design, everything that was like included into this. So I was basically coming from a ZBrush background. Um, for those guys who were still around like 10 years ago, you know, fiber mesh was a huge thing. <laughs> so um, I remember I was posting like my first character online and people were like, oh, the hair looks so rough on this character. <laughs> so, um, and uh, me um, posting this character online, uh, thinking, oh, that's the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, as, as it happens thing, to the best of us, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah people were pointing out my my terrible grooming skills at that time and it, it was just fiber mesh uh so from there um people gave me advices to look into extra and, and uh from there i kind of started getting more into like the technical side of things uh I had to look into extra um did a couple of tests i also worked on a company back then um where I had a lot of like opportunities to work on creatures and also on action at that time. And this is where I kind of slid into the, the whole grooming field and became better at it. I was, I was so terrible, but what really kept me going was always the learning aspect of it. So I think grooming in general has like such a nice balance between like the artistic parts and the more technical parts to it. Um, it's like a combination of both and you, in my opinion, you don't get that often like in 3D in general. And uh, this is what really like drove me into this, like the, the, the love for the detail and kind of those balance, like sometimes you have like more artistic uh, tasks and sometimes more technical parts and uh, yeah, learning aspect in general too. It's, uh, there's like a huge, uh, like, huge fields in growing there's always like a new tool coming out or new oh yeah coming. oh yeah oh yeah definitely so so basically that's how by just like experimenting and constantly learning you eventually build your way through into the whole grooming world yeah basically i i did did a lot of tests uh, watched a lot of tutorials uh, did a lot of like uh, personal projects on my own um, that I posted online and uh, yeah um, and from there it went on and on um, at some point I had a look into like Yeti on a tricks or the other grooming softwares and um, always gave me like little tasks when I was working on my free time projects to to reach out for the next thing that I wanted to cover and uh, yeah how crazy, how crazy. So was there anything like, I, I don't know, like a transition point where you could say, okay, from there on, I definitely became like a full-on grooming artist. Um, yeah, like I was basically working as a generalist still back in Germany. And then a couple of friends reached out to me and were like, hey, they're hiring people in London, <laughs> like in a totally different um, like continent lands, uh, not continent, same continent, but different uh, yeah. land in the UK. Um, so I was um, basically my, it was always my big dream to, to, to work on like movie creatures and, uh, and like a lot of like movies like Avengers. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, inspired me to go um, and pursue this career working in CG or like CG, CG creatures in general. And uh, so I was trying to, 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 to apply at these companies and um, luckily get, uh, got my job uh, in, uh, at DNEC at that time. And uh, I moved over to London and get started at like working with the big fish. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, it was a surreal experience for me. Um, starting out there so I arrived in London <laughs> totally off the boat and was part of this huge company where like all my biggest inspiration and idols were working in like um, <laughs> so how did it feel back then like so yeah good. like I don't know getting to the dream job uh, it was it was surreal it was um I had like a lot of idols that I really wanted to meet at Zenec and like the first day uh 
that put me right next to Vimo Kaketa, which is like <laughs> yes, I know Vimo. <laughs> Oh yeah, one of the biggest like facial uh, sculptors, and uh, <laughs> it was super funny to 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 to, to um, see all these idols sitting with you in the same room, and then it's like there's like this person and this person, and then there was me. <laughs> it was it was very surreal, and um, also like um, to be part of like a culture or like company environment where everyone is like pushing themselves so hard and is constantly motivated it also inspires you so much and I'm very grateful that I had this experience with them and yeah wow cool cool I really love that I really love that transition in the story so um yeah I'm sure it was it, it was a sounds like it was a great experience um so let's go back a little bit to grooming because um since you were one of the, you know, like early adopters of XGen, like back, I don't know, 10 years ago or, or something, um, like you've seen this whole um, industry of grooming evolve so much. So um, how do you see it changes, like it's changes like now and uh, what's on, let's say in grooming? what do you see yourself learning and exploring and what do you think is even relevant now? I think it depends a lot from company to company. What I see is like smaller companies often work with XGen or smaller plugins like Yeti or Onatrix where um, basically it's not as production dependent when you want to change a mesh, etc. What I'm currently learning right now uh, and what I think is like the most uh, important uh, tool of the industry right now is Houdini actually. Um, like uh, there's such a huge, there was such a huge shift in the last couple of years of um, companies picking up Houdini as their main grooming tool. And uh, it gives you so many like creative options to approach problems or working within like a pipeline and like environments where your mesh constantly changes, your, your reset constantly change and um, you're able in Houdini without any issue to, to always like adapt to the newest mesh and um, pick up a new UV set, a new world position of the mesh, etc. cetera. Um, also like from a creative point of view, you have so many options to just Approach one problem there. It's like it's not very streamlined. So you have mm -hmm. instead of like one solution, there are always like five different solutions, and it's very painful to to just go back to like a um, like a program like XGen where it's like very streamlined. And but like as a groomer, I think it's important to be able to to to, to get to know or learn multiple tools, and then. Um, then pick the tool that is right for the problem. So um, there's not like one solution for everything. Like there's one solution for a certain problem. And uh, I think as a rumor, you should be able to um, choose the right pro uh, program for the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely makes sense. So uh, do you still work with both like Houdini, XGen um, on like on a daily basis for different projects? Uh, and I would say on a daily basis, I probably nowadays work with Houdini like almost 80% of the time. Um, sometimes you hit uh, like something that you can't fully um, approach with Houdini, for example. I recently had like a clump structure that I really wanted to, 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 to work on and I, I was not able to come up with the same clump structure that I would be able to come up in XGen without any issues. And I was putting so much time into it, but most of the companies you have um, the option to pick whatever grooming tools you like, in, in the bigger ones at least, mm -hmm. and then um, go from there. So um, yeah, it's usually supported. Um, with the grooming software, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, I guess it's, uh, it's like the, the idea that, uh, that it's pretty hard to learn or at least hard to master. Like what, what are your thoughts on that? What do you think is the learning curve like? Especially you know, like for people who are listening to us right now and who have never had exposure to, uh, to either, what do you think is a good like learning strategy 
like how to approach it if you've never touched uh, both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some structures are like the same between all the pro uh, programs. So you always start with guide curves, which are basically um, the base curves from where your hair generators are generating a lot of curves that are getting interpolated by the shape that you generate. And um, this is like the same throughout all the pro programs. And if you learn like where, like how good guide curves work, where are they placed and how interpolation general works. Um, it's, um, it's something that is the same throughout all the tools, right? And yeah. I would say, if you want to lear learn, start getting into filming in general, I think XGen might be the easiest solution to get in. Um, Houdini, in contrary to that, is very technical. There's like a lot of um, technical knowledge that you need to know before you start um, and how to approach some stuff. So I would recommend if you want to start with grooming, pick up XGen, have a go, see what you can do there. XGen as a tool is uh, pretty amazing. You can do everything there. It's like almost a mini partner. It's like, um, there are a couple of things that are implemented which is interestingly, but um, XGen is perfectly fine. You don't have to pick up Houdini right away. But Houdini is um, just if you are uh, if you want to do some crazy stuff, if you want to change the mesh or um, find like some creative solutions or work faster, I think for that Houdini is definitely better at some points. But yeah, the structures are usually the same guide curves, interpolation, and then you start defining the clumps, et cetera. That's the same for the XGen, Yeti, and all the others as well. Right, right. So uh, do you remember actually, what was it like for you? Uh, like with, it, with your experience, how long did it actually take you to uh, overcome the initial learning curve and kind of start like more of a plane rather than struggling? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, um... It's with every pro or is project it still program. going. No, <laughs> it's, it's probably still going. That, that's always something else to learn, especially with, with Houdini. You can always become more technical and get more into like back scripting and programming, like in a very basic form. <laughs> so, I recently learned a lot of Python um, to, oh. to, to get more into like tools and stuff. And uh, yeah, I would say with every project um, that you work on there's always something else to look into. For me, there was like one Buffalo that I worked on um, where I really wanted to implement like instances of little dirt particles in the hair. And um, then I did that in the next project, which is like, I, I did like a little scribble where I put in all the instances uh, in Yeti, where you basically scatter the hair, uh, the, the debris um, particle in the hair and stuff like this. So I always, uh, gave me another task that I wanted to master in the next project. And I think this is really what keeps me going. Wow, how crazy. So what's your favorite project so far? Like your, I don't know, whichever criteria, like you choose your own criteria. What's your favorite or best project you've worked on? Mm, I would say there are a lot of like good projects I worked on. I really love working on creatures and um, like, uh, fantasies, um, fully CG generated creatures. But I think uh, the best project in my career so far um, that I can talk about. <laughs> oh, yes. But, um, I was uh, working on uh, Captain Marvel and uh, her for zero gravity hair. So that was for Endgame. So yeah. that, that was actually my first uh, project in the industry. And because of the whole surreal experience to finally like work on a Marvel film, which like inspired me since childhood really. And uh, it was amazing. Like the team was so great back then. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So um, is there, I don't know, like since you, you are pretty much exposed to, I guess, like, you know, most recent trends uh, because like typically uh, big teams or big companies would be exploring all the all the most important trends so uh again like uh i'm not sure what you can speak about but uh i'm also curious about your opinion of uh, the impact of ai on grooming specifically because there's a uh, there are a lot of conversations on how you know like uh, ai will impact uh digital sculpting and again like digital doubles and hyper realism so all of this uh, being uh, um, like AI generated 
do you think there is anything that's going to be impacted within like grooming terrain? Actually, I saw like a lot of Disney researchers from a couple of years ago where they basically had like wigs that they scanned and generated AI based um, those like guides and hair strands from scratch, which was like very exciting to see. Um, yeah, I, I think a tool like this would help us if we want to like go um, full, like just copy this whole wig over and get a like 100% replica of that. But I think like in the grooming field, there's a lot more um, like with an artistic background that you can do uh, and um, have to do too at some point. Like fantastic creatures are always something that you can never scan or um, effects work in general, which is uh, creature effects, hair effects. When you um, basically prepare a groom for like this whole simulation aspect where you create a sim rig for it, this is something you always have to set up and uh, what else? Um, I think there's always like some artistic parts like embedded into it that you, that, yeah. that you need to address. And I think AI can't really take that away in the future, especially when it comes to fantastic stuff or stuff that you create from scratch and uh, where you don't have a scan for that. Yeah. So basically, you know, like you're not, you're not uh, feeling like anyhow threatened by the technology in like your position or in your, in your, in, in this industry. Yeah, uh, not yet. <laughs> it's not there yet, but uh, I would say it's, it's the same for sculptors really. Um, I see so many sculptors, although we have like scanning techniques there and you always need like the human eye pair to look over it and really emphasize certain features or there's always like a demand for um, cartoony or more artistic stuff and uh, that won't go away in the future. No, absolutely. Actually, that's a really interesting uh, point that you just touched that, you know, technical versus artistic. Um, like, I think it's also possible to argue to what extent um, we are and, and you are as a grooming artist, um, like an actual, are you more artist or you're more uh, like uh, tech? Like, how do you actually see yourself? <laughs> because it's so technical. It's very technical art. I mean, I'm actually struggling to find a better definition for it because it's, uh, you know, it's like uh, we've, we've spoken about all the complications of software and uh, this whole like pipeline. So um, do you still consider yourself more as an artist or as an like, I don't know, an overlap of um, like tech, IT, art? <laughs> I would say it's a combination of both. Like my, what, what, what interests me is definitely more on the technical side. Um, I, I come from a very artistic background. So I studied art in art school. It's like literally, I did like a lot of sculptures like in real life and painted a lot of old pictures, like uh, the full artist package. And um, like what interests me about the technical side is that you can always learn something and that you have so many like opportunities and if you open something there's still something hidden underneath it and uh, I think like based on that it, it's very close so there's a whole artistic side to it and a whole technical side for it, to it and I think because I learned so much about art in school uh, that I really want to um, explore the more technical side now and uh, this is also what I'm trying to, to um, get better at right now and uh, really dig into. Yeah, but do you think art is uh, art background is uh, required or necessary uh, to be a great groomer or a great digital sculptor? I think, um, like for, for me, I had like uh, the background as a sculptor, so um, I think a good idea for detail is what you need. You need to be able to see shapes in the hair and also the fine detail. So it's very similar to sculpting in some way because you also have like first form shapes and second form shapes and then all micro details like skin pores, et cetera. You have the same in groom basically. You have like micro clumps and big shapes, like the, the primary shapes of the groom um, that needs to match and uh, yeah, a good eye for detail, I think it what counts. Um, also like from, from like drawing background, you're able to like see the silhouette of the character and um, try to match that. I think that helped me a lot from like 
seeing shapes and silhouettes of characters and trying to match that as fast as possible. I think that it's helpful to have, but um, if you don't have that, it's very easy to get into. Like if you put the effort in and uh, learn. Right, right, I see. Yeah, I mean, I agree it helps, but I've seen, I think, examples of both. So it's like also another like endless debate so <laughs> like, what comes first, the art or like the technical um, ability? And um, you know, I also I also wanted to ask you if uh, um, if you see a lot of uh, junior artists, and again, like from your perspective um, on you know, like from working in uh, um, like the 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 industry and in the uh, big company right now. Um, do you see a lot of junior artists entering and, uh, you know, like, uh, as of like, across the board? And do you think it's easy these days to break through as a junior? I think it was definitely easier before the lockdown started. Before the really? lockdown started, yeah, a lot of juniors, I was, uh, at DNEC, I was responsible for the uh, Greenlight program. So I was a mentor there and uh, was mentoring our um, graduation artists, our junior artists that joined them. And uh, I would say since we're all in home office and working from home, there's like definitely more emphasis on hiring senior artists that kind of already knew uh, know the tools and how they work and how to work with pipeline structures. But I think it's, it depends on the company as well. I think for smaller companies, it's probably the opposite that they have like a huge pool to hire people out of. Um, and uh, I think the home office makes a lot of stuff also easier when it comes to hiring people, you're able to hire more people and also to, to um, it's, it's more difficult to train people. That's the only downside. That is so true. That is so true. I mean, it's maybe same level of difficulty to train yourself, but within the studio, 100%, it's almost impossible to like mentor effectively because you just only can go on the one to one basis. This is like such a pain. Um, so do you think there is any tip that uh, you can give to like people who are breaking through and or like, you know, trying to get their first job? Because we just had the, uh, we're running a boot camp this week. So actually, it's, by the time this airs, this is already gone, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we get a ton of questions every day from all of our boot campers, like uh, how to, you know, like polish your portfolio to be seen and uh, how to just like get noticed. Uh, so I don't know, what's your take on that? Or maybe how did you get noticed? Uh, I would say it's very much still like a gig pace, like industry. So I think the first step you have to do when you're a junior to put your work out there, to kind of build a portfolio, get known for your work. So my mistake that I did when I started out, I never showed my work to anyone. So I was always like very shy about my work. And uh, it took me like a huge effort to overcome this fear and reach out to people. And um, back then uh, the group, 10k hours was pretty big on Facebook where it's like you know, so people like like me or others are like going after work uh, they're after work and just check the group for inspiration or anything and yeah I used to post like a lot there after I <laughs> overcome my fear and kind of build up my network got in touch with people actively working in the industry um, which also reached out to me afterwards uh, for the for the London job um, basically so I think it's very important to build up your network, go on social media, post your work, show people what you learned or what you want to focus on and what interests you so they can come back to you when they, they will remember your work if you post it. So um, try, try to overcome your fear and uh, reach out to people. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a really good tip. So do you think posting books is also a good idea or you would always after you overcame your fear, <laughs> publish <laughs> only perfect uh, pieces. I think like when you want to impress people, I think um, posting like finished work is definitely better, especially when you start out because there's so much, at least for me, there was so much going on when it comes to anatomy 
and people were just pointing out all my mistakes. So if I wouldn't have finished my work, <laughs> I would be like, um, it, it, it's quite difficult to get like um, a good critique um, when it's not finished if you start out. So um, usually uh, for me right now, I'm trying to engage with people more and post a lot of work in progress on Instagram stories and just try to, 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 um, to send updates and show people how I approach stuff, I think. This is good to show too, but usually I would, um, if I do like a huge posting thing, I would try to um, like finish up my work. Right. Yeah. 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 No, that also makes sense. Also, I think even, you know, nowadays, uh, social media, especially groups um, and like forums, you know, are getting very noisy. So uh, oh, yeah. just like it's a lot of content and yeah, it can just get lost. So I mean, that's true. That's true. Yeah. 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 So um, like now that you are in the place where you wanted to be, you know, years back, so kind of a, this is done. What do you want? What do you like? Like, what's your dream or goal now? What's kind of a, the next step? I think it's even becoming more technical. I would love to get more into like programming tools and uh, yeah, the, all the options that Houdini gave you with uh, Vex and the whole tool side of yeah. it are just so like so nice you have like such an opportunity to work with templates and everything and build your own pipeline really from home so uh, you haven't had like this opportunity a couple of years back um without cooking yeah. as a software um so this is very exciting for me to get into but yeah uh, for me with the whole artistic background it's very difficult to catch up on like the whole computer science parts uh and everything so for me, this is something that I really want to get more into. And uh, I think the next big part also to get more um, um, like more in, in, engulfed into like uh, education and uh, teaching and um, yeah. I mean, you're already teaching, which is amazing. Uh, we didn't actually speak about that, but we did just before we started the recording. Um, yeah, so you teach at CGMA and Norman, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. Right. Um, currently mentoring the Grooming for Visual Effects course for CGMA, um, which basically is like a. Um, so the Grooming workshop is basically like pre-recorded tutorials, and then there will be like a one-hour live session each week and assignments that I will give reviews on. And for the Norman shop, I recently did like a workshop on Houdini and uh, creature grooms and Houdini in general, how to approach them, different techniques uh, that we also use in the industry currently. And yeah, which is super exciting. Yeah, amazing, amazing. I mean, I've seen the uh, the bits of the workshop from <laughs> behind the scenes. So <laughs> yes, uh, it's like a lot of content to digest. Do you actually recommend it to um, beginners at all or more of like advanced? I would say, like the Houdini workshop is a little bit more advanced. Houdini in general has some ways of um, being very technical of what you want to approach something that should be like super simple. And um, what I would say the workshop works you, walks you through that um, in a slow uh, pace in the beginning. So I'm trying to uh, explain everything in more depth and why I'm doing stuff. So I think it should be easy for you to catch up if you have like some basic Houdini knowledge and the technical backgrounds, what guides are, for example, and stuff like that. So if you have that, it's like a perfect course to get into and then um, learn. <laughs> yeah, um, I realized that we never actually spoke about this uh, before, but uh, what do you think as a, a grooming artist is your second essential skill? So, I mean, to be hired as a grooming artist, you obviously need to know more than just grooming. Um, so uh, would you say that sculpting is essential or there is something else that you definitely need to know? Um, I would say like, uh, it depends on the company as well. So for the bigger ones, it would be good to roughly know about pipelines, roughly know about Linux as an um, OS system. And uh, I think sculpting is always a plus, but you don't have to have it. I think the basics are still XGen and Yeti and uh, to have like an adequate skill level there. So there are always like differences between um, or like beginner mistakes that you see um, 
So I think another thing that might be worth looking into is CFX in general, which is like the simulation of the groom. So if you can show something, can present a character that's like nicely lit and rendered with like a little bit of hair simulation or muscle simulation going on, this is always a huge plus. So you can um, basically show that you're able to like write something that it works in the next department as well. And um, that you know about pipeline and how these different fields work with each other. So I think this is a huge plus. Wow, that's huge. I think this is a great tip because that's kind of, you know, like what many artists I think are asking themselves, how do I uh, make my portfolio to impress? Just like uh, uh, what skills are combinable or kind of a work together as of, you know, like uh, um, if you know sculpting, you should definitely know how to texture and render or at least it's yeah. better, right? So with grooming, yeah, I think, I think that's a great tip on simulations. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, I've got so many questions and uh, <laughs> I was going to wrap up like five minutes ago, but okay, <laughs> I'll try now. How do you actually uh, update your portfolio if you do? Like now as a okay. professional, do you yeah. ever update your portfolio anymore? <laughs> oh gosh, I rarely update my portfolio, I have to say. So if you see my art stage, you can see like stuff from five years ago. But uh, yeah, my latest um, personal piece was the cat groom uh, that I worked for Norman. And uh, yeah, we, um, besides that, I always um, post like personal projects on my Instagram. Uh, sometimes I uh, have trouble <laughs> wrapping up a project because the next part comes that I really wanted to work on or check out and then like my whole personal project gets stalled for a while until I pick it up again like the next two years so there's always something else that distracts me um, but yeah there's actually like a huge professional um, demo reel that I have uh, just like for, um, for, for, for getting in touch with clients or um, companies in general but yeah um, I'm trying to, to, to work on personal projects if I have time it, 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 time is always tricky um, yeah. working as a grooming artist especially like when you have like a full-time job and then um, like yeah. still want to push yourself and keep up with the technology and everything um, but yeah uh, so usually I post like work in progress, uh, progress stuff on Instagram yeah. especially Instagram stories are great for just like something that you yeah, want yeah. To it will go in 24 <laughs> hours <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <okay. Yes. laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. But, you know, I love that, too, because you just said that we should not believe everything we see, because there is always a huge professional demo reel that is not our station, that is not Instagram, that's not yeah. stories. So there is always a huge professional demo reel that's probably also um, uh, covered by NDAs. And, yeah, and password protected and everything. <laughs> yeah, password protected. <laughs> okay well that's cool Kristen um we've got a little tradition here on the podcast um we've got like um a quick questionnaire of 10 questions and you're allowed about a couple of sentences per question ready okay okay so what's your number one tip for combating distractions when working from home oh gosh uh that's a tough one <laughs> um I would say like a routine, like getting up in the morning, putting your alarm, like not 10 minutes before work starts, but like an hour so you can have breakfast <laughs> and uh, get out of your pajama. <laughs> so uh, I would say that's very important. Uh, usually I try to exercise a lot and um, have a healthy diet to just keep concentrated for these eight hours that I put in and uh, stick to um, like routines have an alarm clock set when my break is going to start or when um, when it's, it's, it's time off in the evening. So yeah, yeah. I'm trying. <laughs> Love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your favorite tradition or holiday? Oh, actually Halloween. I love Halloween. <laughs> so when I was uh, living in Germany, um, people not tend to celebrate Halloween like you would do in America or here. So I was very excited when I came over to see like uh, actually Halloween parties taking place. Yeah, you can actually dress up, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it's like almost like in the American movies now or so. <laughs> like then, so yeah. And I love FX makeup, like zombies or skeletons. Oh, I love that. It's of awesome. course, oh my God. 
Amazing, amazing. Um, what's your favorite way to get in some exercise? Uh, currently, I would say it's Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> so I got into it um, during lockdown, actually, when you weren't able to get out anymore. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to, um, besides Pokemon Go in my place, <laughs> I'm trying to um, get a couple of muscle exercises and go for a run every once in a while. Uh, so yeah, yeah, put that in, yeah. in as a routine. Like yeah. It's very important if you like sit in front of a computer 10, time, like 10 hours a day sometimes, uh, we have to like work out your muscles as well in order to really be able to be concentrated and uh, yeah, push to be the best version of yourself. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Um, what's your most used emoji? Oh, actually, I have to look that up. <laughs> okay, one second. Sure. I was like, <laughs> I was going to say, is it like a cat or something furry? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Oh, it's actually, it's actually the muscle, um, the flex. Ah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always like, um, yeah, I fixed my yeah, problem. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I got out of my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what's your source of inspiration? Um, I would say it's like the people around me and then like companies I work in. Like, I'm very lucky to, to have so many inspiring people. But besides that, of course, Art Station is a huge one. Um, and um, Facebook groups in general, there are a lot of like grooming groups uh, and 10K hours. I usually, I um, always like put all these groups first. So when I go on social media, I would only see like the art groups and then I'm like feeling super inspired when I, whenever I go on social media. And I think, yeah, this is, this is great to have nowadays. This sounds like a trip, you know, whenever I go on social media. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying not to though, um, because otherwise it's too distracting. I kind of yeah. like, oh my gosh, this is like, oh, I need to try that. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. somebody yeah. posting like a new like skin pore technique that they're using on their character. It's like, um, very yes. <laughs> um, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh, it's uh, don't be impatient <laughs> from one of my mentors, actually. So um, I think some parts really take time to get better at and for me I was always like very impatient I always tried to work very hard in order to get to the quality level that I wanted wanted to be and sometimes you really have to put in the 10,000 hours in order to get better at a skill and you can't really rush that you really have to sit down learn the basics learn the techniques and uh, don't work harder but smarter and uh, yeah I think this is one great piece of advice I sometimes still have to be reminded of that but uh yeah i'm trying to to really um not rush as much anymore and not become frustrated by the progress i made but really see it like as a learning experience in the long run and yeah cool so how do you celebrate little victories along the way oh um little treats along the way um i'm trying to cook sometimes i'm not very good at cooking <laughs> But whenever I like celebrate little victories, I, I would like go on YouTube, find like a nice recipe that I want to okay. cook and like prepare that, like buy some, order some groceries nowadays yeah. <laughs> since we're not going home anymore. <laughs> um, so if you could see one movie again for the first time, which one would that be? Oh, um, Avengers? Actually, oh no, it's actually not Avengers, I would say. I think for me growing up, I think a huge inspiration was the whole Harry Potter universe. Um, like with the lovely set dressings and costumes and everything and creatures, especially the new ones with the um, Fantastic Beasts. I think yeah. um, that was like seeing that for the first time was like, oh my God, like I, I really want to like create something similar, like Fantastic Beasts. Oh, I love that. I really love that. And the whole universe and the whole creativity that went into it. It's, just fantastic and inspiring and amazing yeah. i've got the last one what's your backup career oh gosh <laughs> <laughs> i ha actually have two um so i think um like version a would be uh, variant a would be um working as a doctor or something medical 
because uh, when I was like uh, getting into becoming a sculptor and like learning about anatomies and all that stuff. So um, when I was a child, basically my dad, he, he was also an artist. So he always do like very detailed muscle studies. And this was when I was like six, seven years old, right? So I was um, always, I always wanted to, he was like my biggest inspiration. So I always wanted to draw as nicely as he could. Um, so I was like in school sometimes just for, uh, like drawing skeletons and like muscle groups, like everywhere, basically in my exams, in my homeworks. And the teachers must have thought, I, what's wrong with her? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, based on that, like the whole anatomy aspect, uh, like I think doctor or um, okay. like something, something medical. Like that. And like, like option B would be, um, you know, sometimes on LinkedIn you get like job recommendations and for groomers, you always get like uh, pet grooming at pets at home or something. <laughs> and it's like, uh, that <laughs> <I think. laughs> that's hilarious. This, this would be actually like very nice just to sit there and uh, groom your dog and uh, <laughs> like something. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god an actual hairdresser i think that would be like my, my back, backup career <laughs> yeah the actual hairdresser so not necessarily just like a dog hairdresser but yeah like a cat hairdresser just like human hairdresser as well wow amazing <laughs> wow Kristen, i didn't expect that would be we would be getting to this terrain at any point but we actually got there <laughs> like grooming actual dogs i mean uh but uh yeah um Thank you so much. I'm just about to wrap up because we're uh, literally out of uh, time for this episode. But um, I think that was insanely productive and uh, we got so much ground covered. Christine, really, really appreciate your time and thanks for sharing everything. And I think that was really, really useful and hope everybody who was listening also enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we should definitely, you know, touch base in a couple of years uh, when you become more technical. I can't wait to <laughs> pick your brain. No pressure, no pressure. <laughs> no, no pressure. But I mean, come on, 700 days is how many hours? That's like, oh. a, that's like a lot of hours. So I'm sure you'll get very, very far ahead. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right, Kristen, thanks again for coming to the podcast uh, and uh, chat soon. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. I hope you guys found this conversation useful and took something for yourself. And if you like this content, please give us a like and ask all of your questions here in the comments below. And I'm going to see you next week right here. Please come back. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Art Heroes Podcast. Check out www.artheroes.co for show notes, more interviews, and free tools made for you by our team of mentors. Tune in next week for more inspiration, and keep up the great work, hero!